Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to the Centre for English Legal History's 2023 annual lecture. Firstly, just a reminder that the lecture is being recorded via Zoom and will be uploaded to the Centre's faculty web page to enable viewing following the presentation. We're absolutely delighted to have Professor Rebecca Probert presenting the 2023 annual lecture this evening. Professor Probert is currently Professor of Law at the University of Exeter. She is also a Fellow of the British Academy, a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences, and a past president of the Society of Legal Scholars. She read jurisprudence at Oxford, completed her master's in law at University College London, and has held teaching and research positions at the universities of Aberystwyth, Sussex, and Warwick. Professor Probert has published extensively on family law and legal history, with a focus on the history and current law of marriage, cohabitation, bigamy, and divorce. She is the author of leading texts, including Cretney and Probert's Family Law and Marriage Law and Practice in the Long 18th Century, a reassessment. This evening, she will be presenting on women and the crime of bigamy in English law, 1603 to 1623. Please join me in welcoming Professor Probert. Thank you very much for that introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here this evening. So bigamy is sometimes seen as a somewhat old fashioned crime, the stuff of Victorian melodramas and golden age murder mysteries. And it's also um, often portrayed as a comical crime, the basis of farces such as run for your wife. Now, and putting together the slides for tonight's lecture, I did what was intended to be, you know, very short search for a suitable image. And then found myself scrolling through endless adaptations of Ray Cooney's uh, 1983 play. There's West End productions, there's amateur productions, there's international productions. There's one poster for an Indian adaptation, which describes it as the world's longest running and funniest comedy. <clears throat> but this is, we should remember, a man who is deceiving his two wives and leading a double life. So tonight's lecture is about why bigamy isn't funny. <laughs> and why we do need to take it seriously. And I think the, a lot of the scholarship on bigamy does imply that it is treated quite lightly. So a number of historians, including Lawrence Stone, have claimed that it's punished very leniently. And other scholars have suggested that it's acceptable if certain um, conditions are observed. If the man's been honest with the second wife, if he's supporting the first wife. In other words, if there's no element of, of deception. And certainly we see in those cases, um, certainly in the later period, as I'll come on to explain, that type of bigamy is punished much less severely. But it's also not necessarily the typical form of bigamy. So what I want to do in tonight's lecture is, is show how seriously bigamy was taken and why it deserves to be taken seriously. I'm not going to try to give um, a comprehensive overview um, of the position from 1603 to 2023. I realised um, when trying to pull it all together, that was quite ambitious, but I do want to highlight um, certain issues of particular relevance to women, both in the past and today. So just to sketch out what I'm going to be doing, I'm first going to look at the changing parameters of the crime. Um, and again, it's important to, to remember not every remarriage is bigamous and exposing the parties to criminal penalties. I'm then going to look at the changing punishments and the changing conceptualization of the crime. And then I'm going to focus in on women as perpetrators 
and women as, as victims. So start then with the, the changing parameters of the crime. So our starting point is 1603, uh, when James VI of Scotland ascended the English throne. Now, Scotland, it should be noted, had already made bigamy uh, a criminal offence. But Scotland had also made provision for divorce on the basis of either adultery or desertion, whereas in England and Wales, there was no such option. Now, among the first acts to be passed under James is one making bigamy a criminal offence in England and Wales. Previously, it had only been dealt with by the church courts. Now it was made a felony. But I think the absence of any option for divorce is reflected in the exceptions that are included within the act. And while these were not explicitly gendered, some were more likely to apply to women than men and vice versa. So we, we start with the very forceful um, title of the legislation. And its opening line seems to be pretty, pretty absolute. If you're married and you marry someone else, this is a felony. However, as I say, there are then numerous exceptions to this. And one or other two exceptions refer to the absence of a spouse. So set out the, the provision there in full, exceptions to those whose husband or wife should be continually continually remaining beyond the seas by the space of seven years together, or whose husband or wife shall absent him or herself, one from the other, by the space of seven years together, in any parts within his majesty's dominions, the one of them not knowing the other to be living during that time. So the reason I say this is two exceptions is because it was interpreted as encompassing two quite separate rules. So if your spouse is overseas for seven years, that is a defence regardless of whether you have notice of them being alive. If they're in England and Wales, then um, there's this additional um, condition that has to be um, satisfied. And Hale discusses this in the, the Pleas of the Crown, um, quite tersely, it has to be said, um, a man or wife absent above seven years, second marriage, no felony, if beyond the sea, though notice of life. If in England, then without notice. But he's clearly capturing those, those two exceptions. And I think given the greater opportunities for men to travel, then these two exceptions will have benefited women to a greater extent uh, than men. And certainly we can see that in later centuries for which data is available, as I'll come on to discuss. And so these exceptions went some way to mitigating the absence of any divorce for desertion um, or any process by which the death of a spouse could be presumed. The 1604 Act also created an exception for those who had been divorced by any sentence had or hereafter to be had in the ecclesiastical court. Now, this is the provision that's probably created the most discussion and confusion. So Bernard Capp, for example, has suggested that the meaning of divorced is ambiguous here. And it's true that at this time, the term was used variously to apply to annulments, 
as well as to the, uh, the separation known as divorce and mensa rectoro um, that the ecclesiastical courts could grant. But if you read on, the very next provision relates to annulment. It talks about where the former marriage has been um, declared to be void by the ecclesiastical court. So if we have an explicit provision relating to annulment, it would seem very odd then to interpret divorced as also meaning annulment. It's clear that um, it was interpreted to apply to divorce and mensa toro from the start. So calendar for the Middlesex sessions includes the case of Francis Carpenter, accused in 1615 of marrying William Carpenter, not being divorced, nor her first husband, nor her first marriage having been declared null and void. So it's clearly making that, that separation. So what then are we to make of the case of Margaret Porter in 1636, which is usually cited as proof of the uncertain scope of this exception for those who are divorced. Now, Margaret had remarried after being granted a separation and then sort of thorough on the ground of her husband's cruelty. And I sort of use the word separation there because the word divorce didn't actually appear in the sentence in her case. And counsel makes quite a big thing of this, that there's no reference to a divorce in the sentence, therefore she can't be said to be divorced. She's only been given the liberty to live separately from her husband for her safety. And the Court of King's Bench did indeed express its doubts as to whether Margaret's case fell within the scope of this exception, noting that if this should be suffered, many would be divorced upon such a pretense and instantly marry again, whereby many inconveniences would ensue. Now, I don't think that there's any ambiguity as to whether the 1604 Act applied to those who had obtained a divorce of Mensa at Toro on the basis of adultery. And just a few months after Margaret Porter's case, um, Thomas Middleton is similarly accused of bigamy. He produces his sentence from the ecclesiastical court whereby he's uh, obtained a divorce on the basis of a wife's adultery. And it's held that he has a good defense. So I think the only question in Margaret's case is about the ground on which the divorce or separation is, is granted. And there were plenty of contemporary commentators who argued that adultery should dissolve a marriage altogether, but no one was arguing that cruelty should have this effect. So you can see why they might have thought there was a difference between the two. And adultery also had a very clear and obvious and precise definition, whereas cruelty did not. And that, I think, helps to explain why the courts are here referring to a pretense. To put it bluntly, this is a case where male judges are concerned about women essentially coming up with allegations of cruelty to get their separation, their divorce, I'm answer at Toro, and then be able to remarry without any repercussions. So this is a case where gender is key. And the work of Laura Gowing and Joan Bailey has shown that it was far more likely that it was women who were obtaining um, divorces and answer at Toro on the basis of cruelty uh, than men were likely to do. So I think it's, it's hardly uncontroversial to suggest that violence against women is not really taken that seriously in 17th century England. 
And that explains the result in Porter's case. Also worth bearing in mind that just over 30 years later, Parliament began to pass private acts of Parliament allowing wealthy men to divorce their adulterous wives, whereas it took 300 years for Parliament to legislate to make cruelty a ground for divorce in and of itself. So, although the Act appears to be gender neutral on the face of it, there's important differences in the way that it applies to men and women. I say there was, there was even a bizarre attempt to argue at one point that it expressly excluded women altogether. Um, I'm just putting this in to lighten the mood slightly, as a, and also as an example of how having counsel didn't necessarily mean that you got sophisticated legal arguments. So very early case of counsel appearing for the defense at the Old Bailey in the 1730s, um, runs the defense of Mary Somers on the basis that the act only applies to those um, who marry having a wife still living and therefore can't apply to her. This is quite quickly countered by counsel for the prosecution on the basis of everything else said in the act, um, past practice and reason. Um, so nobody else, as far as I'm aware, ever tries to run this argument that women weren't um, included within the scope of the Act. Now, the 604 Act governed bigamy until it was replaced um, by the Offences Against the Person Act in 1822. And this narrows the defences or the, the exceptions that are available. So the scope of that seven year exception is narrowed. It's clarified that you will only have a defense if you don't have notice of the other spouse being alive, regardless of where in the world they are. And this is, you know, hard to fault as an amendment, particularly given how much had changed in the 224 years since the uh, initial act had been passed. Um, you've got a huge increase in trade and travel to the rest uh, of the world. And having a um, different rule for those whose spouses were beyond the seas, did look particularly anomalous after 1801, where you could be beyond the seas, but still in the same kingdom. So I think this is quite a belated um, change. However, again, it is also one that does have particular consequences for women. And it has consequences for women because of the widespread use of transportation um, from particularly late 18th century and into the 19th century. So period of transportation, usually the minimum period is, is seven years. Could be longer, but it's usually for seven. So if your spouse has been transported for seven years, then even if you have letters from them, even if you know that they're still alive, under the pre-1828 law, you still have a defence if you've married after that seven years has elapsed. After 1828, any letter, any news of them being alive is going to you know, stop the clock and start, the, start it sort of running again. And with approximately seven times more men than women being transported, it is the left behind wives that this impacts on. Second key change that the 1828 Act is, makes is also to remove that defense of divorce and mensa et toro. 
Again, context is very different um, by this point. You do now have uh, at least the possibility of a full divorce um, in a way that wasn't available in 1604. And all of these exceptions are then carried forward into the 1861 Offences Against the Person Act, which remains the current law. You may be wondering why the very specific crime of bigamy is included in an act dealing with offences against the person. And I'll come on to this um, in a moment when I look at the way that the, uh, the crime is conceptualized. But before doing so, I just quickly need to sketch out the changing punishments for bigamy in order to make sense of that. So, changing punishment. I'll deal with this quite quickly. So, one of the reasons why it was so important to have all of these exceptions in the original legislation is because the death penalty would otherwise um, apply. And... It's also worth noting that the impact of this is very different for men and for women in 1604. So death penalty was mitigated by benefit of clergy. So essentially, if you could read, you weren't going to be put to death. But for most of the 17th century, this benefit is not available to women. It's only in 1691 that it's finally extended to women. So we do have examples of women being sentenced to death for bigamy in the 17th century. By the 18th century, however, I haven't found a single example of anyone being sentenced to death for bigamy, even though that's not been formally repealed. It is just branding uh, that's the standard offence. There's then a very brief period um, in the sort of late 1770s, 1780s, where bigamy is treated quite leniently. So you might expect a shortish period of imprisonment and, and a fine. But this is immediately then followed by a bit of a backlash, a sense that it isn't being taken seriously enough. And under the 1795 legislation, the alternative of transportation for seven years or two years imprisonment is prescribed instead. Transportation continues for bigamy roughly until um, 1853. Um, the last person, um, Sentence to transportation for bigamy was ironically on his way to Australia with the second wife. <laughs> um, but there was a storm and the ship got, you know, sent back to shore and he got arrested and convicted and sent off to Australia without her. Um, which I think might just be the judge having a slight sense of humour because it is a very late example. 1861 Act then substitutes um, penal servitude um, or imprisonment for, for transportation. But for present purposes, what I want to sort of highlight is the differentiation in the um, potential punishments. So you have transportation or two years imprisonment, and you have penal servitude or shorter period of imprisonment. So this is the point at which you start to get a much more um, gradated, much more nuanced view of bigamy. And that, as I'll show, does lead to changes in how the harm of bigamy is conceptualized. So if we look again, starting with 1604 Act, it would seem to be conceptualized as an offense against God. The preamble um, refers to evil disposed persons um, running out of one county to another and getting married to somebody else to the great dishonor of God. And I did wonder, realize, reading this, you know, 
is this just something that crops up in every statute from this period? Is this just the kind of little formula that they pop in? But it doesn't seem to be particularly common. I have found other examples of it, but it's by no means a, a formula. By the time Blackstone was writing in the late 18th century, the range of offences perceived as being offences against God had, had narrowed um, somewhat to those specifically uh, affecting religion or the church. He's a bit less certain about where bigamy should be placed within his new scheme of things. So he includes it in a chapter dealing with offences against health, what he terms public policy and economy. And he sort of produces a, an explanation of what he means by that. But I think the, the key point of interest is his admission that this is a heading that covers a very miscellaneous um, set of crimes that he can't actually fit in under any of his other heads of crime. And that sort of touches on what's to be a sort of perennial issue with bigamy. That once we stop conceptualizing it as an offense against God, nobody's quite sure where to put it. Now, as I said, there's it's only when you start to get the possibility of different levels of punishment that you start to get judges talking about what a varied offence bigamy is. But it becomes quite standard part of the narrative to say this is the most variable of offences. It's the one that more than any other affords room for mitigation or aggravation. And what emerges as a key factor is the harm done to the second spouse. So we've got this a very emotive quote from Samuel Romilly here, saying, you know, few crimes can be more atrocious than that of a married man who representing himself to be a bachelor prevails upon a modest woman to become his wife. He possesses himself by fraud of her person. So there was a certain logic to bigamy then being included within the 1828 Offences Against the Person Act. This was what judges were primarily saying the harm of the offence was. However, there was a difference between the harm of bigamy being assessed by reference to the impact on the second, second wife and bigamy being conceptualized solely as an offense against the person. So it's quite interesting to see how textbook writers react to it. Archbold's 1828 edition moves it into the section on offences against the person. 1835, he moves it back into the section on offences against um, public um, policy and uh, economy. And judges and magistrates were also quite keen to emphasize that you couldn't just reduce bigamy to an offence against the person. So Mr. Justice Maul, for example, um, pronouncing sentence on a female bigamist at the Lancashire Assizes in 1841, acknowledged that she hadn't done much injury to either of her husbands, but justified her punishment by describing bigamy as an offence which interferes with the security of the institution of marriage and also of the institutions of all civil society. We also have another judge framing it a bit belatedly as an offence against God. And when counsel for one bigamist 
tries to say that the, you know, the second wife is probably going to say that she hasn't been injured at all and does this case nearly really need to go forward, the magist magistrate's retort is that the law has been injured and that is sufficient. So we have this sort of formal classification as an offence against the person in terms of where it sits within the statute, but then we have this, this pushback from the courts in terms of saying that that doesn't really capture um, the crime fully. So I'm now going to bring these different strands together and look at women as perpetrators. And here we see very different patterns in, in different centuries. So 17th and early 18th century, it's really, as far as the uh, trials go, a straightforward matter of guilt or innocence within the terms of the statute. Were you married? Did you marry somebody else? Do any of the exceptions apply? There's no argument about any kind of moral gradations, any sense that some bigamies are more or less excusable or more problematic than others. And women did account for a fairly substantial percentage of those accused of bigamy in this period. Still a minority, but it's 30%, a fairly substantial minority. What we do also see, and it's sort of perhaps natural when you think about the, the penalty, is very high acquittal rates. So you do get a sense of um, juries not really wanting people to be sent to the gallows for bigamy. And women are always more likely to be acquitted than men. We then have an interesting drop in the late 18th century. Drop in the percentage of women being prosecuted for bigamy, it roughly halves um, between the mid 18th and the late 18th century. But there's also a corresponding increase in the percentage being um, convicted. So you can map this against the, the changing punishments as those convicted were no longer risking death or branding, juries became more willing to find both men and women guilty. Now, the drop at this particular point is actually consistent with a drop that we see for other criminal offences. So I don't think we necessarily need to be searching for a bigamy specific reason. However, it does coincide with that period that I mentioned where bigamy is treated much more leniently and also with a more misogynistic narrative. So there's the very well-known um, trial of the Duchess of Kingston in the 1770s. Um, this trial leads one newspaper to, to joke that female judges, joke enough in the 1776, female judges insist that one husband is punishment enough. Now, this particular gag is repeated quite a lot over the years that follow, but always with the genders reversed. Um, and the, the horror of having two spouses is brought out in this um, cartoon of, of 1780. Um, Martin Madan had published um, a book 
um, advocating polygamy. And this is the cartoonist response to it. So you have this unhappy male being um, physically attacked by, by both of his wives um, with the none too subtle subtitle um, being Dr. Madman restored to his senses. And you also have um, sort of jokes circulating about how the punishment for bigamy among the Norwegians um, is being obliged to live with both <laughs> wives at once. It's the Norwegians for most of the, the 18th century. 19th century, it switches to the Hungarians for some reason. Um, clearly they're having to sort of identify some more remote and exotic country. But it's always gendered. Then from the 1790s, we start to see the courts more explicitly um, differentiating between male and female bigamists. And this links back to this idea of it being an offense against the person. Contemporary assumptions about female sexual passivity and male desire meant that women were simply not seen as guilty. So no one ever argues in any of the cases that any man has suffered any harm by being entrapped into a, a bigamous marriage. And some of the female bigamists sort of play on this sort of idea as the, the passive party um, by arguing that they only entered into this marriage because the second husband wanted them so much. Uh, there's the case of Lucia here in 1800 where she tells the old Bailey that um, the second husband had, had vowed, he'd put an end to his existence unless she, she married him. So really she was doing a good thing. Um, and she's also portrayed as giving her evidence in this faint and tremulous voice. And she is convicted and sentenced to, to three months in prison, but this is a relatively lenient sentence for the time. Overall, women are much less likely to be sentenced for transportation for bigamy and much more likely to receive only a short sentence of a month or less. So we have fewer women being convicted of bigamy and those being convicted receiving lower sentences. But of course, there's always dangers in drawing inferences about criminality from what comes to court. And a lot of the sort of debate about female criminality has sort of raised the question of, is this a real difference between male and female behavior or just a selection in terms of who was prosecuted? I think here looking at bigamy can help to make a, a real contribution to that debate because it's very hard to get evidence of people who've committed um, a theft and not been prosecuted for it. But it is easier to trace bigamists who were not prosecuted, at least with the assistance of family historians. So I want to pay, um, pay my thanks to all of those family historians who have supplied me with information about bigamists um, who were never <laughs> prosecuted. I put out a call via the um, online sort of newsletter, Lost Cousins, and got hundreds of responses, which allowed me really to build up a picture of the differences between the prosecuted and the unprosecuted. Now, at first sight, the most striking finding might seem to be that there's a lot more women in the unprosecuted sample than in the prosecuted sample. 
So first half of the 19th century, women accounted for 18% of those prosecuted. In my sample of unprosecuted, they accounted for 32%. So quite a difference. However, there's good reason to think that many of them should not be described as bigamists at all. And this is where those crucial exceptions come in. So the most striking finding was that the time that had elapsed between the first marriage and the second marriage was about seven years longer in the unprosecuted sample. And drilling down into the details as to when couples were known to have separated or last known to be together, I calculated that perhaps as many as 65% of my sample would have had a good defense to bigamy, either on the basis of seven years separation or a genuine belief in the death of the first spouse. So these were people who weren't prosecuted because they hadn't actually committed bigamy within the terms of the act. And women, I should say, were even more likely to have waited than the men in the sample. As a very, very broad generalization, men escaped prosecution by moving and women escaped prosecution by waiting. So there were some real differences between men and women in the terms of the likelihood of them committing bigamy. Final section, I want to look at women as victims. And there's four key issues I want to bring out in terms of the, the implications for second wives um, of this narrative about the offense against the person. The erasure of the second wife in one of the, the key narratives about divorce in this period and then the remedies that were gradually um, conferred on first wives and second wives. <laughs> so, come back to this conceptualization of bigamy as an offense against the person and thinking about it from the perspective of the women who are the victims. Now, this conceptualization meant that the offense was mitigated if it had not resulted in the ruin of the second wife. So there were a few cases where the marriage had not been consummated, um, sometimes where it was detected um, particularly speedily. But normally this argument depended on showing the sexual experience of the, the second wife. So you have some quite uncomfortable questioning by counsel for the defense of the second wife as to whether she has had sex before the bigamous marriage. And this could be with the husband-to-be, it could be with somebody else. Whoever it is, it's seen as mitigating the bigamist's offence. Even if she had known that the second, that the marriage was bigamous, that's also seen as mitigating the offence. It's seen as a sign that she wasn't really that concerned about her marital status, so clearly the harm to her isn't as great. Now, judges are very clear that where the second wife doesn't know and hadn't had any sexual experience before the marriage, then the fact that the first wife had behaved badly is no mitigation. However, in the 1840s, a new narrative starts to emerge. It's what I call the, the divorce narrative. 
So this is essentially the narrative about the poor man driven to commit bigamy because his first wife is unfaithful and he has no means of obtaining a divorce. And it's, it's a narrative that does play a really important role as part of that broader campaign for divorce and a narrative that results in a few bigamists receiving lighter sentences. Now, I think it's, it's understandable that contemporary campaigners for divorce wanted to sort of gloss over the inconvenient deception of the second wife in cases like R versus Hall. The backdrop to this slide, by the way, is Warwick Crown Court, where Thomas Hall was tried in 1845, and where Mr. Justice Moore supposedly came out with this big critique um, of the limitations of, of divorce law. Moll does identify the deception of the second wife. Very few of the later accounts acknowledge that. You know, so if Thomas Hall is gonna be the poster boy for divorce law reform, he has to be the good guy. You have to ignore the fact that he's deceived the second wife. I think it's more surprising that that divorce narrative has also dominated so much of the scholarship um, on bigamy. Um, possibly because it's seen through the lens of divorce and commentators are, are highlighting these, these few cases. If you look at what's happening in the courts, judges are still emphasizing the harm to the second wife. Um, and not really um, taking that much account of the bad behavior of the first. And I think the divorce narrative is also problematic because it overlooks the really bad behavior of so many of the bigamists. These are not people who are committing bigamy just because, or in many cases, even because the first wife has been unfaithful. These are violent, nasty, exploitative men. And I have lots of stories that I don't have time to share with you. Because I do want to touch on um, Matrimonial Causes Act 1857, which was the culmination of that campaign for divorce reform and which created for the first time a new court with the power to grant divorces. So you no longer have to petition parliament to pass a private act in your favor. And it does give remedies to the first wife whose husband's committed bigamy in that although adultery by itself is not sufficient, bigamy with adultery is now grounds for divorce. And for these purposes, bigamy is interpreted much more broadly. So it doesn't matter if you might have a defense to a criminal charge, if you've remarried, it's bigamy for the purpose of allowing your spouse to obtain a divorce. And then finally, I have time, I want to look briefly at the belated protection for the second wife. So I have a nice picture from the 1950s here to reflect when um, second wives actually started to, um, to get some protection. And the initiative as so often came from Lord Denning. So, there's the 1954 case of Shaw and Shaw, where Denning in the Court of Appeal quite creatively uses um, breach of promise and the idea of a warranty um, to say that the, um, the widow, the bigamous widow, is entitled to what she would have received 
um, if she had been legally married to the man. Um, he's essentially arguing that you know, by going through a ceremony of marriage, this constituted a warranty that he was free to marry, um, a warranty that he railed, he broke at every point. Denning gets very irate in this case. He's even more creative in the next case where the um, where both parties are still alive. Um, so this is a case from 1955. The bigamous wedding had taken place as long ago as 1907. The parties had been separated for 20 years and the wife had made it clear that she wouldn't marry him legally, even if he asked her to. So the whole breach of promise line was a bit hard to run. But Denning, again, uses this idea of the warranty um, to argue that there's an ongoing breach and she should be put in the same position as if she was a legal wife. Now, it may be that these cases exposed the lack of protection, or it may be that people thought they should try to rein Denning in by providing some, some proper remedies. But in 1958, just a few years after this, um, the possibility of making a claim to the estate of the deceased is introduced, initially where the marriage has been annulled, and then as long as the claimant had entered into it in good faith. And there's also a particularly complicated um, set of cases about the difference between a decree of nullity and a declaration. So put it simply, the essential difference is that if the court makes a decree of nullity, it can grant the same financial remedies as on divorce. If it's granting a declaration, then it can't. And the courts have been a bit cavalier as to which they granted, because I don't think they were always thinking through the consequences. But in 1962, in Kasim and Kasim, Mr. Justice Allrod says that the only um, appropriate remedy is a decree of nullity, giving you the powers uh, to make um, provision. As I say, there's a whole complicated back history there, but for present purposes, this is the point at which um, the legal protection accorded to the second spouse is transformed. So it would be nice to end on that, that positive note of um, greater protection, fewer bigamies, the modern availability of divorce, meaning that the unhappily married no longer need to resort to bigamy. But the absence of divorce is only one reason why big individuals committed bigamy. And only last month, uh, if anyone was listening to Woman's Hour, there was um, a woman on it talking about her recent experience of being um, deceived and exploited and conned out of sums of money. So this is not a problem that has gone away. And the remedies that are available for a second spouse <coughs> also depend on the court being able to grant a decree of nullity. And here again, we come to a very modern problem. So an individual can only be guilty of bigamy if they are recognized as married and they go through a form of marriage that is recognized by English law. So it's possible for an individual to go through multiple religious only ceremonies without risking prosecution for bigamy. And these ceremonies described by the Court of Appeal as non-qualifying give the parties no right whatsoever to apply for provision on either separation or death. They have the rights of cohabitants, not spouses. So I think there are still very good reasons for taking bigamy seriously, 
for thinking about the parameters of the offence, to think about the appropriate punishment and to articulate its harm. Thank you.